Today we want to come and uh, spend some time looking at the three letters that were written by the Apostle John. These have been uh, traditionally known as the Johannine epistles or letters of, of John. Now as we want to think about some introductory matters uh, together, we need to begin by coming to appreciate historically the, the context in which John is writing. The, uh, the early church uh, had a tradition that John, after the, the destruction of Jerusalem, came and established his spiritual headquarters in Ephesus. That uh, sometime during 67 to 70, with the Roman army coming into Palestine, that, that during that time, John moved to the Roman province of Asia, and then for over 20 years uh, had a, a ministry uh, from, the, from the 70s uh, into the 90s that was centered in Ephesus. He followed Paul and then followed Timothy as the spiritual leader of uh, the church at Ephesus and there in, particularly the 70s and the 80s, exercised a, a spiritual oversight to the churches that have been established in the Roman province of Asia. It is, it is an exercise of that ministry that these three letters from John emerge. Now, a very important passage is found in 1 John chapter 2, verse 19. Uh, John is here speaking about some individuals that have previously been a part of the church, and yet had left. Uh, he speaks uh, beginning in verse 18 of chapter 2, 1 John. Children, it is the last hour. And just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have arisen. From this we know that it is the last hour. So he speaks of these Antichrists, these who were opposed to Christ, and in verse 19, he says, they, the Antichrist, those opposed to Christ, went out from us, but they were really not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out in order that it might be shown that they are not of us. So he, he speaks about these individuals that we refer to as schismatic false teachers. He speaks about the, uh, the church, those who were committed to the truth, and particularly those who were committed to the truth concerning Jesus Christ. So uh, he says that... Uh, uh, this is the church, and uh, he refers to this in 2.19 as being the us. And some have left us. And of course, this becomes within the context, the them. They went out from us. They are not of the truth, but they are those who follow the lie. They do not follow Jesus Christ. Rather, they are anti-Christ. So that uh, he, he speaks of those who have left. And that's why we refer to them as schismatic false teachers. They have created a schism within the church. And even though they have departed, they 
continue to seek to have access and influence into the churches to whom John is writing. And uh, whenever you have those who follow the lie but claim to follow the truth, those who claim to give the truth concerning Jesus, although they are really anti-Jesus, the, the us that remains, the we that remain within the church, uh, the question arises, well, we, do we truly follow the truth or not? And it is uh, that issue that John is going to deal with uh, within these letters. He, uh, he speaks in chapter 4. He, uh, he speaks in verse 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Right? These false prophets would be the they, the Antichrists who have left the, uh, the church, gone out into the world, and the believers still need to, to test the spirits, to, to test where the, the motivation, the empowerment is coming from uh, for, for, for these who are, who are uh, proclaiming uh, to be from, from God. Notice he uh, speaks again in verse uh, 3 that uh, these are the ones who do not confess that Jesus is from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. So tie him back to chapter 2 that as he speaks about these false prophets, these false teachers who have gone out into the, uh, to the world, that uh, they are uh, characterized in the same way as those who departed from the believer's and, uh, and were those who followed the lie, the spirit of Antichrist that uh, was seen in chapter 2. And then when you get to 2nd and 3rd John, and John will, will uh, speak about these, these deceivers who have gone out into the world. 2nd John verse 7. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ has coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. So he is writing this letter to warn the chosen lady and her children who were walking in the truth. And uh, he was, uh, he was uh, glad, he rejoiced to hear that they were walking in the truth. But he wants to make sure they continue to do so. And so he warns them about these deceivers who have gone out uh, into the world as well that uh, they would uh, not be influenced by these, uh, by these deceivers, by these antichrists. And then even in 3 John, he says again in verse 4, as he's writing to Gaius, I have no greater joy than this, to hear of my children walking in truth. And, uh, and the fact that there were, were those who who were teaching truly, verse 8, therefore we ought to support such men that we may be fellow workers with the truth. Uh, these, are, these are men like John and like Gaius who were committed to the truth. Uh, they were not of the spirit of the Antichrist. And yet there was a, a church leader, Diotrephes, who loves to be first among them, doesn't accept what we say, that here is a place where in the church where Gaius finds himself, where the, the uh, false leader was still within the church and was, was uh, seeking to force Gaius and seeking to force uh, John himself uh, out of that church. And uh, uh, John just uh, writes to uh, tell uh, Gaius that he had sent a man by the name of Demetrius. He was of the good testimony Gaius should receive him. His witness is uh, true. He has uh, many other things to write. He's also going to deal with diatrophies, but uh, that is going to take place in the future. Uh, so again, we see that there is a, a distinction, a division 
between those who know the truth, practice the truth, walking the truth, teach the truth, and uh, those who are opposed to John and opposed to the truth, like a diatrephes. So in the, the introduction to these letters that John writes, we find the context is uh, uh, within this historical situation where a schism has taken place in the churches that John oversees. That there were these false teachers, these false leaders, many of whom had departed from the church, gone out into the world, and yet continue to influence the believers who remained within the church, who were under John's spiritual oversight. And John is concerned about those who remain that uh, they might have any doubts removed from their mind that they were truly following the truth as revealed in Jesus Christ and uh, not following the false teachers, not following those who had uh, gone out of the churches as uh, John had dealt with them. And yet, as we see from 3 John, some still remain seeking to, to, to force out John and those who would follow him. And so there was a schism. There was a division. Uh, there were those of the truth, those of love, uh, those of God. Uh, there were those of the lie, uh, those who, who did not follow the way of love, who followed the, the spirit of this world, the spirit of Satan and uh, were really not a part of the truth. And so it's within this, this context, a context that uh, Peter had warned would be taking place as false teachers would come in to the churches. False teachers had come into the churches that John exercises spiritual oversight and, and had caused a rupture within those churches as uh, some had left and followed these false teachers. And uh, so uh, John is writing to, to churches, to believers who were facing the, uh, the effects of the schism, of the division that had been uh, brought about by these false teachers. Now, as we read the Johannine letters, we get some indication as John speaks of what the teaching was, uh, was of these who were creating the schism among the believers within the churches. And from John's emphases, we can get some insight into the the teaching of these false teachers. Uh, within the context we've already seen in uh, 1 John chapter 2, these antichrists who, had, who have for a time been associated with the church, professed faith in Jesus as the Messiah, and continue to speak of Jesus. But in some way, according to verse 22, John says, who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. There is a denial that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the Messiah sent from God the Father into the world. And the Messiah was uniquely the Son of God, that uh, in accordance with the Old Testament prophecies, God himself and the person of his Son had uh, come to the to the earth to, 
to be the Messiah, to be the king who would uh, gather the, uh, the sheep of Israel and bring them under his authority. And so the, the liar, the, the false teacher, was uh, the one who denied that Jesus was the Messiah. 5.1, whoever believes that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, is born of God. And whoever loves the Father loves the one born of him. But uh, notice that uh, the one born of God confesses that Jesus is the Christ. And verse 5, who is the one who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. The Son of God sent into the world by the Father to, to fulfill the, the promises given within the Old Testament that uh, he was truly the Messiah. John also speaks about the, uh, the fact that these false teachers in some way deny that the Christ came in the flesh. Uh, we see this in 1 John 4, 2. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit does, does not confess. Jesus is not from God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist. In, uh, in 2 John, the deceivers, verse 7, are those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. So that uh, in their denial of the Messiahship of Jesus, it somehow revolved around that the person of Jesus was truly not a flesh. He was not truly human. That in, in some way, God had, had come upon him and yet he truly was not of the flesh. Uh, some believe here that we might have a docetic Christ, a docetic Jesus, that the man Jesus that at his, at his baptism by the Spirit, the Spirit came upon him, and in that way, he was able to display some kind of messianic ministry. But before the, before the cross, before the crucifixion, the, uh, the Spirit left the man, Jesus. And so it was just merely as a man that he died. Or the fact that, uh, that, uh, that, that Jesus was not Christ in the flesh. He was not Messiah in the flesh. And it could be that way that they were denying the full human divine individual known as Jesus was the Messiah. And so they denied that the Messiah was human. The Messiah had come in the, uh, the flesh. They... Uh, they denied, it seems, their own sinfulness. According to 1 John 1.8, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we say we do not have a propensity to sin, that we are not characterized by sin, that we are not essentially sinful. That is deception and a lie. If we say we have not sinned, if we say we have not committed a sin, verse 10, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. And uh, so the way John phrases this implies that uh, the one who 
deceives is first self-deceived concerning their own sinful condition and their own acts of sin. Uh, they, they deny their, their propensity to sin and the individual acts of sin which result. Uh, therefore, they also deny salvation through Christ. So, um, uh, verse uh, 2 of chapter 2 of 1 John, he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. Uh, is a propitiation. He has come to divert the wrath of God against sin, and even against those who would deny their own sinfulness. Uh, Jesus has, uh, has come for them as well. I think he's using the same kind of phenomenological language that uh, we saw in uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1 at this point, that uh, they for a time confessed and stated that they followed the truth and followed Jesus Christ. And so uh, Jesus was their propitiation. And those who've gone out into the world, as uh, he is for those who remain uh, as believers within the churches to which Jesus, uh, to which John is writing. Yet, uh, uh, yet we see here that uh, there is a a denial that uh, uh, that Jesus' death. Uh, was uh, sufficient for them. Uh, they deny salvation. They deny their own sinfulness. And so why, did, why do they need Jesus to be the propitiation uh, for their sins? They, uh, they deny uh, righteous conduct. Uh, they deny the reality that... Uh, that the truth is to be seen in their conduct. Uh, one six of First John, if we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. So these deceivers say that the pattern of their life is, is immaterial to their claims to spirituality and to knowing God. Um, 2.29, if we know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. And of course, the implication is those who do not practice righteousness are not truly born of God. So that uh, these, are, these are men who deny the fact that uh, truth is to be seen within their conduct. And, of course, John makes it very, very clear that, that the one who claims to be of God, to be, to be speaking the truth from God, should have that truth reflected within their behavior, within their conduct. Uh, they also uh, deny brotherly love. 1 John 2, 9, the one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. That uh, one of the ways in, in which the love of God will be shown in those that are truly is is the fact that they will truly love their their so-called brother, that uh, they will respond in love and practice love uh, toward the uh, professing believer in Jesus Christ. And uh, so he, he uh, states very, very uh, definitely that, uh, that the one who hates his brother is in darkness. 
and he comes back to this in 1 John uh, chapter, uh, chapter 3, that, uh, uh, that the, the one who is of God will uh, truly love the brethren. And, of course, he makes that very, very clear in chapter 4, uh, verse 8. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And by this the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his Son in this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son. So verse 11, beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And uh, these false teachers deny that uh, their love for God should be seen in uh, their love for their brothers, their love for others within the church. And then finally... And uh, we've seen in 3 John 10 that, uh, that these false teachers oppose John's authority. They refuse to recognize him as uh, being an apostle. They refuse to recognize him as being a Christ-commissioned teacher for the flock of God. They refuse to respect his person. They refuse to, ref to, uh, to respect his teaching. And of course, because he is the one exercising spiritual oversight over the churches, that is why they have departed from his authority, God's authority, departed from his teaching. And that is why John is... Uh, directed by the Holy Spirit to write these letters to, to state the fact that his authority comes from Jesus Christ and as one authorized by Jesus Christ, he is speaking the truth and that those who are truly born of God will bring themselves under the authority of John and his authority is displayed within these letters that uh, he is writing. Now it is uh, impossible to be precise on exactly when these uh, letters were written. It is uh, believed, since nothing is brought up within these letters, of the Diocletian persecution, that uh, uh, the the persecution that. Uh, that comes about under the Roman emperor, and uh, I just misspoke, it was the Roman emperor uh, Domitian, that uh, is the backdrop when we get to the book of Revelation, that uh, John is just free at this point. He is dealing with, um, uh, with internal matters within the churches, uh, that he is exercising God-given oversight, so this leads us to believe that it was written sometime between 70 to 90. And uh, since the schism had taken place, the schism was a reality. Uh, they usually dated sometime in the decade of the 80s of the first century. That is sometime between 80, 80 to 90 and uh, were written uh, before the, the uh, writing of the, of the book of Revelation that uh, uh, we will see when we get to Revelation 2 and 3, we'll speak about these churches not only still being hounded by false teachers, but also outside attacks as well, persecution. And uh, none of that is in these uh, three letters. Therefore, it is believed that they were written before the book of Revelation. Well, quickly, some of the, uh, the themes that emerge within these letters. John speaks extensively of uh, the person of God and particularly the, the fatherhood of, of God, the sovereign one, the one who is over his people. And uh, he speaks of the father's relationship with Jesus with his son. Uh, he, 
he can say in 1 John chapter 3, when uh, he says, the one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose. So notice that Jesus is viewed as the Son of God. He came that he might destroy the works of the devil. We've already read uh, 1 John 4, 9. God has sent his only begotten Son, his one and only Son into the world, that we might live through him. Verse 15, whoever confesses Jesus is the Son of God. God abides in him and he in God. And uh, we've read 5.5, uh, five, who has overcome the world, but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. And verse 10, the one who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. The one who does not believe God has made him, is a, has made him a liar because he has not believed in the witness that God has borne concerning his Son. And so John speaks much about the fact that God is the one who has sent Jesus, who is the Son of God, who has the very characteristics of John, of a God, into the world. And God also sustains a relationship with his children, that uh, those who have come to faith in Jesus as the Son of God who recognize their sin and have come to Jesus Christ for salvation, are now the children of God. First uh, John 3, 1, See how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called children of God. And throughout all the Johannine writings, it is Jesus who is the Son of God. It is believers who are children of God. Children of God, and such we are. Beloved, verse 2, now we are children of God. And it has not yet appeared as yet what we shall be, because when he appears, when Jesus appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him just as he is. At that point, we will be transformed into uh, to those who perfectly reflect God as does Jesus. We have been born of God, 1 John 3, 9 and uh, 10. We are children of God, not children of the devil because we practice righteousness. We love the brethren. That is the characteristic of those who are children of God. In a 4.4, he refers again, you are from God, little children, and have overcome them. That is the Antichrist who have gone into the world because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Verse 6, we are from God. Verse 7, everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. So as, as you go through the, the uh, letters and coming to 3 John, verse uh, 11, the one who does good is of God. The one who does evil has not seen God. So John emphasizes two things throughout these letters. That is that God has a unique relationship with Jesus, the one who he sent into the world. He is the Son of God, and that's who we confess. And those who confess Jesus as the Son of God have God as their Father, and therefore are his children and are born of God. And being born of God, they practice righteousness. They, they practice uh, love. They, they imitate what is good and do that which is good as a reflection of their relationship with God the Father. So 
John is, is uh, certainly emphasizing God's relationship to Jesus Christ and God's relationship to those who have been born into his family as his spiritual children. And of course, the one who denies that Jesus is the Son of God is one who does not have a relationship with God the Father. Second of all, and we've already seen this with the false teachers, that they deny that Jesus is the Messiah. Therefore, John takes special pains to point out that Jesus is the Messiah. We've already uh, looked at chapter 2 verses, uh, with the context, but in verses 22 and 23, John asks, Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Messiah? This is the Antichrist, one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. So one has to confess that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is God come in flesh as Messiah and Savior so salvation is only found in him. We've seen uh, 4.3, that uh, the spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. Whoever confesses, verse 15, that Jesus is the Son of God. This is uh, the one truly born of God. So he emphasizes Jesus as the Christ. He also speaks of love. We've already read 1 John chapter 4. Love is of God. And God loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for the one to turn away the wrath of God for our, son, for our sins. And so there is an emphasis that God loves and God shows his love in sending Jesus into the world as Savior. But then also that those who have experienced the love of God and have his love perfected in them are those then who both love God and love their brothers. And uh, uh, verse 16 of 1 John 4, God is love. And the one who abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. By this, Love is perfected with us that we may have confidence in the day of judgment because as he is, so also are we in the world. Verse 19, we love because he first loved us. Verse 20, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For, he, for the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. Of course, there's a reflection here of what uh, John has uh, recorded in the farewell discourse in the Gospel of John. That uh, uh, as uh, John spoke, uh, chapters 14 and 15 of uh, the Gospel of John, that the love of God is seen in the fact that... Uh, that a, beloved, that a believer will respond to the commandment that Jesus has given and love his brother as well. The one who abides in God and has God's word abiding in him is the one who will follow the commandment to love his brother also. And so this gets to the fact that uh, John makes it uh, also abundantly clear as you go through these letters that the one who truly knows God is the one 
who follows the commands of God. He is obedient to uh, what God has spoken. 1 John 2, 3. And by this we know we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him the one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he also walked. Beloved, John says in verse 7, I'm not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. That is the beginning of your Christian life, a commandment that goes back to Jesus himself. The old commandment is the word which you have heard. So the commandment reflected in the commandment that Jesus gave to his disciples, uh, that uh, commandment is to be obeyed. Uh, John chapter 13, if you, if you love me, then love your brother also. That new commandment that, uh, that was given to the believers. And John says that is a command, and it's a command to be Obeyed. It's a command to be practiced. We ought to walk as Jesus also walked. And he broadens beyond that, 322. Because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. And what is the foundational commandment? Chapter 3, verse 23 of 1 John. And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. And the one who keeps his commands abides in him, and he in him. So there is, there is the reality of the believer, the one who truly believes, shows it by the fact that uh, he obeys. He obeys the commandment that uh, God has given to believe in Jesus Christ, to love one another, and from that flow then the obedience to the other imperatives that uh, God has given to the church of Jesus Christ. The one truly born of God will seek to obey what the Father has communicated and what commandments the Son has given. He comes back to these uh, commandments in Second John, verses uh, 4 through 6. I was gl very glad to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we have received commandments to do from the Father. And now I ask you, lady, not as writing to you a new commandment, but the one which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, that you should walk in it. The deceivers do not walk in the commandments, but uh, the believer is to do so. Again, the foundational commandments that came from Jesus Christ to love one another. And uh, from that flow, the commandments that uh, are given to the, the church. They're a reflection of uh, the commandments that uh, Jesus Christ had given to the disciples. And then I, I've listed the, uh, the verses uh, for you. But again, a very key term that was in the farewell discourse not only the, uh, the commandment to love, but also the fact that the believer is to abide in God, is to remain in God, remain in the vine in Jesus Christ, and in the word and commandment that Jesus Christ had given to the disciples. 
that, that in the gospel of John is made very, very clear that the true believer is the one who abides, who remains in Jesus Christ and his word. And uh, the, the same truth is emphasized in the, in the letters of John, that the believer is the abider. And I have uh, listed for you the, uh, uh, the, the verses. Uh, we've seen the, uh, the, uh, the concepts in 1 John chapter uh, 3, verse 24. The one who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. So the one who keeps the commandments from God abides in Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ abides in him. And we know by this that he abides in us by the Spirit which he has given us, the assurance that uh, we have of Christ abiding in us is the fact that we have the Spirit that has been given to us, the Spirit that allows us to test the spirits, the motivation of the false prophets, and how do we know we have the Spirit of God? We confess that Jesus Christ is the Messiah come in the flesh. We abide in the truth. We abide in God's love. Uh, we abide in Christ, and Christ abides in us. This is the, the focus of what we see in 1 John. And he brings this aspect of abiding when we get to 2 John, 2 John 2, for the sake of truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. It is the truth that abides in us. Verse 9, anyone who does, who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching, he has both the Father and the Son. So you abide in Christ. You abide in the teaching of Christ. You abide in the, the love of God, the love of Christ. You abide in the commandments, the words. Uh, all of this is reflective of the true believer in the Johannine letters. And so as we, as we think through the, uh, the themes, it is very important, says John, that as a believer in Jesus Christ, you believe in the truth. That your profession is a profession in the truth. Believing the reality of the Father as he has sent Jesus Christ into the world and through Jesus Christ that we come to know the Father. We're able to, to declare the truth and then our life is characterized by keeping the command of Jesus Christ to love the brothers as ourself and show by this that we abide in the very commandments that Jesus Christ, the commandment that Jesus Christ has given to us and the commandments that flow from that to believers. So he is, he is saying that it's, it is both for the true believer a profession of the truth and a living of the truth. And uh, that is the false teachers, a distinction of them and of those who practice their teaching is the fact that they neither confess the truth nor live in the truth and show by that that their profession is not true. All right, as we return to our discussion of the John Hine letters, uh, let's look uh, now at the purpose and the structure of uh, each of these three letters. In 1 John, John gives uh, two statements. This helps us to appreciate 
what his purpose is. At the end of the letter, in uh, chapter 5, verse 13, John writes, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. Notice his, his audience are true believers. Those who believe in the name, the name stands for the person, the characteristics, as, as I have shared with you in this letter that Jesus is the Son of God sent by the Father into the world, that He is God in flesh, that He was sent into the world to, to be the Messiah, sent into the world to be the propitiation for our sins, that as I have communicated to you the character of Jesus Christ, I have written to you who believe, who accept as truth what I have written about the name of the Son of God. And I have written to you who believe in order that you may know that you have eternal life. What I have been seeking to communicate is those who truly have this faith in the reality of who Jesus truly is might come to experience and truly have the assurance that you have eternal life. Because the the problem caused by schism, when you have John saying, I'm proclaiming the truth, and false teachers saying, we are proclaiming the truth from God, is that doubt, a lack of assurance that right, even though I have not departed from John's teaching, the teaching that comes from God, like those who follow the false teachers, is this really true? Is this really from God? Do I truly have eternal life? Am I really following the right way? And John says, this is my purpose in writing that you as believers in the truth might have assurance of eternal life. And that eternal life is a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, John chapter 17, verse 3. And so in his introduction in verse 3, John speaks about the fact that he had physically seen and touched Jesus Christ. Uh, what we heard, what we have seen with our eyes, we be held in our hands handled concerning the word of life. Verse 3, what we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also that you also may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. John is, in his prologue, assuring the, the believers that he has physically seen, physically touched, been physically in the presence of Jesus Christ, the word of life, and that what he had seen and heard from Jesus is what he was proclaiming to them that as they came to that belief, they might also have fellowship, both with John and believers and have the assurance in that fellowship that they were also having fellowship with the Father and with Jesus Christ, that they knew Christ, that they had eternal life. And then returns to that in 1 John 5, 13 to say, this is the reason that I've written. I have written to give you assurance that I declare the truth 
And uh, that as you have responded to that truth and abide in that truth, that uh, you have eternal life. Now, 1 John is one of the most difficult uh, sections of Scripture uh, to outline. Uh, John will we'll keep circling back and re-emphasizing the truth that he is proclaiming from, uh, from different angles. Yeah. He is seeking to make sure that his hearers truly are assured that what he is uh, saying is, uh, is from God, that they, they, they grab a hold of the truth and uh, truly come to have the assurance that they are believers in Jesus Christ. Now, as I've already stated, this, this letter begins with an introduction, but not a usual um, epistolary introduction. In fact, uh, 1 John is the one letter within the New Testament that has neither a, an epistolary introduction nor an, in a, nor an epistolary conclusion. That um, it seems to, uh, to be a tract. It seems to be an overarching message. And uh, some... Some scholars of the Johannine letters really believe that 1 John was written as a cover letter, and 2nd and 3rd John are specific letters uh, to, uh, uh, to two individuals or a church and an individual uh, that, that were specific. And then this letter that was sent to more than just uh, those two churches, those two believers, but uh, was a cover letter that was sent within particular uh, letters that follow a very definite epistolary uh, style uh, in 2nd and 3rd John. But, of course, there's no evidence to either prove or disprove that theory. Certainly, as we have 1st John, it does seem to be a little more general in, inter in orientation and uh, certainly could be a letter that uh, was written to a number of churches within Asia, the Roman province of Asia that had been impacted by the schismatic false teachers. But uh, John has a very definite introduction, and uh, in chapter 5 we'll have a very definite uh, conclusion. Well, in the, uh, the prologue, as we've seen in verse 1, he emphasizes that as a writer, he is giving an eyewitness testimony of the word of life. A, an eyewitness testimony to when Jesus was here upon the earth. And uh, notice he truly was a man. Uh, we are hands handled concerning the word of life. And uh, not only that, but of course he, he spoke and what was uh, spoken says, uh, says the writer, and it has to be John, uh, because John is, is speaking here as an eyewitness of Jesus Christ. He is one who was with Christ upon the earth and implied obviously has seen the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He was an eyewitness, verse 2, of the historical manifestation of the word of life. The life was manifest, and we have seen and bear witness and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. And, uh, so he places himself among the apostles, and, and uh, though John's name is never used, because of the time when he was writing, he would have been the only one of the Apostles who was still living. It's very clear from church tradition, and he is claiming apostolic authority for the things that he is writing within this letter. And uh, his purpose that uh, the 
readers might also have the assurance that uh, they know Jesus Christ. And verse 4, so, we, so these things we write that our joy may be made complete. Uh, our joy being completed by the fact that you have the assurance that you too know Jesus Christ, walk in him, and have eternal life. And so this introduction, which uh, John clearly shows his apostolic credentials to be writing what is in the letter. This is not, uh, this is not just anyone who is uh, confirming the truthfulness of uh, the proclamation of what God has done in Jesus Christ. This is an apostle, and this has the veracity, the truthfulness, the authority of an apostle of Jesus Christ as uh, these words are, are penned to these believers. That's already seen from 1 John 5, 13. John is writing to give assurance that a true believer in Jesus Christ has eternal life. And so he wants to give the assurances that one is a true believer in Jesus Christ. How do you know that you truly believe in Jesus Christ? How can you have this assurance of eternal life? How can you know that your profession is not a mere profession like the false teachers and those who followed them, but really you possess in reality Jesus Christ. You have a living, vital relationship with the Father through him. And he gives a, a number of ways in which the believer who is hearing this apostolic uh, communication might know that uh, he is truly born of God. He begins by, by affirming that God is light, 1-5. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. God is completely righteous, completely holy. There is no taint of sin in God the Father. And this becomes a basis of fellowship that one recognizes his sinfulness. For verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. It is, it is the one who recognizes his sinful condition and his sinful actions, realizing that Jesus Christ has, has come to cleanse from all sin, 1-7. The one who truly comes to have fellowship, and then on the basis of the provision of fellowship through Jesus Christ, through his death, his propitiatory death, then, as we've seen, obeys the commandments of God, walks as Jesus walked, loves as Jesus has commanded to love, and is separated from the world and his actions. That's as one's life manifests the the forgiveness of sin and the, the, the growing practice of moving away from sin to righteousness, that one's life reflects the God who is light, that through this fellowship with the Father who is light can come the assurance that one truly is a believer. Then we uh, come to the second great 
affirmation. And the, uh, the second great affirmation is the fact that, uh, that God is, is truth. And now we have the, the conflict between truth and error. And uh, so he can, he can uh, speak about the facts that those who respond to the truth of Jesus Christ, those who know the truth and practice the truth, because there's a conflict between truth and, and error. And uh, this leads to a conflict between those who practice the truth, the children of God, and those who practice the error, the lies, the children of the devil, that uh, the one who follows the, uh, the truth and therefore will love and and judge the the errors that are within the world that uh, the one who will affor- affirm the uh, the truthfulness of uh, of God and walk according to that truth can uh, can be assured of the fact that uh, they truly have eternal life so God is light God is truth, and then in chapter 4, 7 through 5, 5, God is love. And, uh, and because God is love, he has sent his son to be the propitiatory sacrifice. And again, the results of that love in the life of the believer is uh, the fact that uh, he Again, we'll keep the commandments and uh, we'll walk in love both toward the Father and toward other believers. And then in chapter 5, verses 6 through 11, we have the, the witness of the spirits because the spirit is truth and uh, the spirit will witness to our spirits, to the believer, that uh, the believer truly is a child of God. And uh, so uh, we see these assurances, and as John completes the body of uh, of his letter that speaks about these assurances, he can bring in conclusion that uh, the believer can have the certainty of salvation, the confidence of answered prayer. With the proviso, we'll come back to the interpretive issue that uh, there is one prayer for which he cannot pray because God will not answer it. And yet God will give certainty that uh, the true believer is born of God. And a final warning that as believers who know God, little children are to guide them, guard themselves from, from idols. That uh, if you're led astray to a, to a God who has not revealed himself in Scripture, and uh, if you... If you go back into Gentile idolatry or with all the false teachers, with a God who has not clearly revealed himself in Scripture, a, a God of, of human making, then it is uh, that which will lead you away and uh, bring doubt into your life on whether you truly are a believer or not. So this is the, uh, the structure of 1 John. In 2 John, we have the author who will now refer to himself as the elder, the well-known elder. Remember, an apostle could also refer to him as an elder. Peter had done that in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1. As a fellow elder, he was appealing to the elders within uh, that 
letter, the under shepherds of Jesus Christ. Well, now we have the predominant elder. And uh, we've seen in the New Testament an elder was one who was to guide the flock in the truth of God's word and guard the flock from the false teachers and their false teaching. And John, rather than giving his name, speaks of himself as the elder, the well-known preeminent elder within the churches to which he is writing. He is the guide in truth and the guard from error. And so he refers to himself not by his name, but by his office. And uh, by using the article, he is saying there is no more predominant elder whom God has raised up to, uh, to minister to you than I. And again, within that historical context, if an elder, if an apostle was still alive, he would be that preeminent elder. And of course, that's what uh, early church tradition tells us about John. And when we get to Revelation, John will call himself a prophet and clearly speak by name. He was the last of the apostles to, to be alive. He can characterize himself as the elder. And as the elder, as the teacher of truth and the guardian against error, the apostolic authority as elder, the elder warned about showing hospitality to any false teachers. And the structure of 2 John, as we said, follows a, a very definite uh, epistolary pattern. You have a, a salutation in the first uh, three verses. We find out the, the sender of the letter is the elder. The receiver of the letter is the chosen lady and her children. The, the elder says that he loves the lady and her children in truth and uh, sends in verse 3 his salutation of grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, from Jesus Christ that comes in truth and love. And then the occasion, verse 4, I was very glad to find some of your children walking in truth. Just as we received commandment to do from the Father. He commends the chosen lady and her children because he has interacted with the chosen lady's children, some of them, walking in truth and love. And he wants that to continue. He is aware of the false teachers, the schismatics, the deceivers who would uh, come in to the chosen lady and her children's uh, home. And so basically he appeals for love and obedience and gives a warning about these deceivers. And then in verses 10 and 11 says, If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house. Do not give him a greeting. For the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. And what he is warning about there is that all right, as these false teachers, these deceivers gone out into the world, as they, as they come into your presence, all right, since there uh, was not the uh, wherewithal to, as they traveled, to, to have uh, the, the inns, they were well known as dens of iniquity, as we've spoken of before, that these teachers had to be embraced and, and taken care of 
by, uh, by the believers. And what John is saying is, you make very careful observation, make sure that they are really teachers of the truth, because if they are not, don't show hospitality, don't greet them because at that point you are participating with them in the sharing of their false teaching. You're participating with them in their evil deeds. And so that is the, uh, the purpose that uh, don't show hospitality, don't receive them. Don't aid them in their uh, giving forth of this false teaching that uh, upsets the believers. Now, this is essentially what he wants to communicate because in the epilogue, verses 12 and 13, he uh, says he will, he is hoping to come and speak face to face. And the children of your chosen sister greet you along with the, the, uh, with the author. And so he says, I've got other things I want to communicate that can wait until I, I get there. But this can't wait. And so I've sent this uh, short letter uh, to deal with, uh, with the fact that uh, these False teachers might come before I personally come to visit you, and uh, you need to know how to deal with them before I get there. And then third John, uh, we see uh, John uh, speaking through this letter. Again, he is the elder, and now he is writing to beloved Gaius. And by speaking to him as beloved Gaius, he is a believer. And uh, John is affirming the fact that Gaius is a believer in Jesus Christ. He is a beloved one whom I love in truth. And uh, he commends this true believer, commends to this, uh, to this true believer one who is coming and names an unworthy church leader, Gaius, uh, you don't need to listen to this leader within the church you find yourself in, but you do need to embrace this true teacher who is coming to you, and I'm writing to you because I know Diotrephes is going to reject Demetrius, so I'm asking you to show hospitality to Demetrius when he uh, comes to your, your town. And so uh, Gaius, as a beloved brother who walks in the truth, I want you to embrace the, the true believer, the true brother, the true teacher, and uh, not follow the... the Directives that are given to you by an unworthy church leader. All right, now this uh, works out so with this structure. Again, a very definite epistolary structure. We have the salutation we already looked at in verse 1. And then uh, the, the author prays for Gaius' health and expresses his joy for Gaius walking in the truth. Beloved verse 2, uh, beloved 1, Gaius, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health, just as your soul prospers. So I pray that, in, that, that your bodily health might be in measure as your, your spiritual health. For I know your spiritual health because you're walking in the truth. This testimony has been given to me, and this brings me great joy to hear of my children like you walking in the truth. 
And so I know what is taking place in your city. And so I want to give you my evaluation, my commendation of you in verses 5 and 8, that uh, you support traveling Christian teachers. Verse 5, you're acting faithfully in whatever you accomplish for the brethren, especially strangers. For they went out for the sake of the name, verse 7, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support such men that we may be fellow workers with the truth. Gaius, we should, and that's exactly what you are doing. Now, I wrote the diatrephes. To the, probably to the effect that as believers you should judge the teachers and embrace those who practice the truth and show them hospitality. I have sent in that to Diotrephes, but he will not respond to my authority. And uh, so... Beloved Gaius, verse 11, beloved one, do not imitate what is evil. Don't follow the practices of diatrephes, but what is good. And so diatrephes is of the truth. And we also bear witness, and you know that our witness is true, concerning the truth and concerning what we say about Demetrius. And so we commend him also as one who walks in the truth implied that you show hospitality to him. And like Second John, John's epilogue is very simple. I have other things to communicate to you, Gaius. And I hope to come and visit you personally. But I need to write this because you're going to have to deal with Demetrius and Diotrephes' uh, lack of response to him before I get there. So I've written what you need to know before I get there. And uh, I, will, I will speak more to you uh, when I am able to be personally present with you. All right, so this is the structure of Third John. Now, as far as uh, some good resources on the Johannine letters. Exegetically, the, the good work to have is the work by Stephen Smalley in the Word Biblical Commentary series. He uh, does like his, uh, like his uh, counterparts, uh, does a good job of interacting with critical scholarship sometimes being swayed by that critical scholarship, and yet also uh, uh, interacting with some of the good evangelical works of generations past. So it is, uh, it is a good work in the sense that uh, he has interacted with uh, the exegetical uh, issues, and if we don't always agree with his conclusions, at least there is a is a strong discussion uh, of the uh, lexical and syntactical uh, exegetical issues that arise from the text. If I could start one work to have, it would be the work by D. Hemben Hebert on the Johannine Epistles, an excellent work uh, based upon the Greek, but uh, made very accessible for the English speaker. Probably the last generation, the work that has had the most impact upon evangelicals is the work by How High Howard Marshall in the NICNT series. And uh, because of that, you should be well acquainted uh, with that volume. And uh, two expositions. Uh, John Stott's work in the Tyndale New Testament commentary series, though having a nature like number two of English interpretation actually flowed out of his preaching of the Johannine letters. And uh, so uh, there is an expository 
uh, atmosphere as you read his uh, commentary on the epistles of John and is well worth having for that reason. And then uh, Berg's work in the NIVAC uh, speaks in terms of here's the interpretation and here are the principles that can be applied to a contemporary audience. Again, he does not uh, give you, as we've said about this series, uh, does not give you exposition itself, but uh, certainly helps you think through the process that can lead to your exposition of uh, these letters of John. So these are at least some adequate um, exegetical, interpretive resources, expositional resources that are available for the jo Johannine letters. Now we have time to look at uh, two major interpretive issues. Uh, first, uh, the, the first interpretive issue is dealing with the sin leading to death that uh, John mentions in 1 John 5, 16, and 17. We've already talked about the, uh, the context. He says in verses 14 and 15 that we can have the confidence that God will answer our prayer. Verse 14, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And we know that he hears us in whatever we ask. We know that we have the requests which we have asked from him. So we can have this confidence that we ask, and connotation is prayer, ask in prayer. And if it's according with God's will, he will do it. And if we know he hears us, we can know that we have the requests that we ask from him. We can have the certainty of answered prayer, and as God answers our prayer, this is an assurance that we are truly His. But in verses 16 and 17, there is the caveat. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin, not to death, he shall ask, and God will give life to those who commit sin, not to death. So if you see your brother, and your brother is sinning, but the sin is not a sin to death, you may confidently ask God, and God will give life. But the believer needs to understand there is a sin to death. I do not say that he should make requests for this. You see your brother sinning a sin to death. Don't make requests for this. Now, all unrighteousness is sin. Both of that which does not lead to death and that which leads to death. All unrighteousness is sin. And there is a sin not to death. It's still unrighteous. It needs to be forgiven. And if it's forgiven, there will be life implied for that one for whom the other believer prays. So what is this sin to death? Because within the context, John seems to be implying that his audience can make the distinction in unrighteousness toward that which is and has the possibility of forgiveness and that which doesn't. Now, a number of uh, questions arise. If anyone sees his brother, all right, we understand here the brother is truly a believer or the brother is only a professing 
believer. Because if anyone sees his brother committing a sin, not leading to death, but there is a sin to death, but notice John doesn't say necessarily that is a brother who is committing that sin. Second thing, what about life and death? Is he talking here about physical life and death or spiritual life and spiritual death? Now, the first interpretation says that he is talking about spiritual life, I'm sorry, physical life, physical death. That, uh, that if you see the brother committing a sin that is not to death, that is to physical death, pray for him. But there is a sin leading to physical death. I notice he doesn't say the sin, just a sin. Don't make request for this. And so this is either a specific sin or a pattern of sin which culminates in physical death. Interpretation is given by Hodges in the Bible Knowledge Commentary. But John has been using in 1 John life and death in the sense of spiritual life and spiritual death. That it is the, 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 the one who has the spirit of Antichrist who does not have life but is uh, doing those things that result in, in death. So I would lean toward those who would see this as, as not a sin that leads to physical death, but he's talking about something more, much more seriously, a sin that will lead to death, that is spiritual death, God's judgments. Well, is that a specific sin resulting in spiritual death? And there's been many proposed specific sins Homosexuality, though there's nothing within the context to say that. Particularly D, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. If there is, if there is a sin, that certainly the readers of John should understand. It is the, it is the unforgivable sin that Jesus spoke about. Or it is a final culminating sin. That is, there is a pattern of sinful behavior and not a specific sin. It can be within different individual's life, a, a sin that the practice finally is judged by God saying there can be no forgiveness of that sin. It results in spiritual death. As you can see, the majority of commentators, and I would be in their company, say within the context of First John, John has made it very, very clear there is a sin that leads to death, and that is the rejection of Jesus as Christ, the sin of apostasy, those who've fallen away from the faith and departed from us because they were not of the truth. And so if, if one sees a brother committing a sin not unto death, some unrighteous act, then they are to pray to God for that brother and, uh, and God will give him life. God will not hold that sin against him based upon because he's a brother, what Jesus Christ has done upon the cross. It will not lead to spiritual death God will grant life. But that is not true of every sin. There is a sin that is apostasy that produces spiritual death. And as we've already, we've already seen in, in Hebrews that one who renounces their faith and 
2 Peter chapter 2, to have the knowledge of truth and then to reject it is to be in a, a much more serious condition that will lead to spiritual death. You see that. You see apostasy, that final renouncing of the previous profession of faith in Jesus Christ. That is a sin, both in 1 John and the letters leading up to it, that uh, is an unforgivable sin. That is the sin that John seems to be speaking of here. And then there is, as you can see, a great amount of debate upon who is the chosen lady, the elect lady. That the majority of contemporary exegetes, as you see, take the chosen lady to represent a church, her children being the believers who make up that church. Now, of course, the problem is that the, nowhere within the New Testament is uh, the church referred to as a lady. Now, it's referred to as a bride. It's uh, referred, obviously, as Jesus Christ and his bride. Uh, but the term here is lady. And uh, so Hebert says that we should take the term, and so does Dr. MacArthur in the study Bible, at its, at its literal meaning. That this is a a elect lady, that is a lady who who has been chosen by God, has faith in Jesus Christ and her family. But others say, no, broadly you can make the bride be at this point the lady. And so he is referring to a chosen group of believers, a chosen lady, the church, and her children. Now this has an, an impact when you come to the point of 2 John in verse 10. What does it mean, do not receive a false teacher into your house? Is it saying that a local church should not provide hospitality, a greeting, a platform for a false teacher? Or is it saying that since this is a chosen lady and choice, a family that no family, no believing family is to accept a false teacher into their physical house and take care of them and speed them on their way. Now, we know from the rest of the New Testament that if physician has a local church, that is very definite. The local church is not to allow a false teacher to be able to teach within their midst. They are to, as we saw in Jude, contend for the faith, to, to make sure that a false teacher does not have that, that platform to propound error. I think we have to be open to position B, at least for the application which means that uh, we have responsibility as individual families within the church of Jesus Christ not to welcome false teachers into our home and uh, allow them a platform. And that has very particular application today to what we allow to come into our homes by means of even uh, television and literature and not just uh, personal association of that which we allow to come into our homes, but to, uh, to realize that era has no place within the home of a believer. Well, we live in a day and an age, as we've talked about, where false teachers and false teachers are all around us, that we have uh, those many that have left the true church of Jesus Christ and established false Christian churches. 
They're all around us. They departed from us. They were not of us. Because if they were of us, they would not have left us. And yet, particularly with, with new believers, as they see these other expressions of supposedly Christian churches, is the apostolic message really the truth? And then like a diatrephes, we have many churches where we have individuals and leaders who no longer respond and obey apostolic authority. So that we need to be very, very aware of these issues that John speaks to continue into our present day. And uh, we need to to be assured that we follow the apostolic teaching and then are willing to listen to the truth and respond to the truth as the chosen lady and Gaius were challenged to do by John. So that uh, in churches and in a culture uh, ravaged by false teachers and their teaching both today inside and outside of the confessing church of Jesus Christ. The message of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John still needs to be proclaimed. And uh, I would challenge you to do that as, uh, as God equips you and allows you to be an instrument of truth in the midst of error even within our own day.